guy's definitely some kind of monster. Why don't you wait till we can get some more light in here? I've got some light. More gargoyles, Skelly. Lots of them. Sculpted in clay. Why would he keep him in a secret room? Mulder, what is it? What do you see? Mulder! Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we'll be exploring the Gargoyle, which is a demonic entity and the primary antagonist in the 14th episode of Season 3 of The X-Files, titled Grotesque. The Gargoyle was a frightening and demonic creature that would possess the minds of its host and force them to commit abhorrent crimes in its honour. As witnessed with the effects it had on multiple characters in the episode, most notably John Mostow, a creative serial killer that was a secondary antagonist in Grotesque. In the episode, we discover that Mostow had been murdering innocent men around town and hiding their bodies in gargoyle sculptures he'd made out of clay. While it's never explicitly revealed whether or not the entity actually existed or was a product of the character's insanity, its ability to affect the mind of other people, including Agent Mulder and his mentor Patterson, leads me to believe that it was indeed real. Written by Howard Gordon and series creator Chris Carter, the main story was conceived after Gordon began noticing beautiful yet haunting stone gargoyles on a number of streets in New York. While at first glance he thought nothing of them, after researching the mythology behind them and seeing more than the streets, he began to feel more and more unsettled, and like any great creative, he began developing a tale involving the possession of characters by a gargoyle spirit. While in the past the sculptures were used to serve the specific function of diverting water from the roofs of buildings to the ground without damaging the exterior design of the walls, with the ancient Egyptians, Greeks and the Romans all using animal shaped water spouts for this purpose, many Catholic churches also used them as a means of illustrating the face of evil to the then mostly illiterate masses. The word gargoyle also comes from the French legend of Gargouille, a medieval dragon that haunted the city of Rouen, whose horrible image became the symbol of the condemned and the demons of the underworld that inspired dread. It is said that Saint Romanus, the former Chancellor of the Merovingian King Clotaire II, had subdued the fire-breathing monstrosity and destroyed it in the fire, but due to the fact that its head and neck would not burn as a result of being tempered by its own fiery breath, the head was mounted onto the walls of a newly built church to ward off evil spirits. When it comes to the idea of gargoyles being symbols for demonic entities, inspiration for these concepts can be found in 20th century literature, early film, and modern pop culture. Great examples of this would have to be the 1932 film The Horn of Vapula, and even Ghostbusters, which both explore the notion of gargoyles housing demonic spirits. Now, the episode begins at George Washington University, where a group of artists are sketching a nude model. However, we notice John Mostow's sketch was unlike the others, featuring a demonic creature in place of the man everybody else was drawing. He also cuts his hand and smears his blood on the drawing before running out with his artwork as the session finishes. When the model reaches his car after the class, he is attacked and killed by an obscure assailant presumed to be Mostow, who is then arrested the following morning by an FBI task force led by Mulder's former mentor, Bill Patterson, played by Kurtwood Smith. While Mostow is led out of the room filled with grotesque sketches of gargoyles, Patterson finds a utility knife covered in blood which had been used by Mostow to disfigure the faces of his victims. Mostow, who was explained as being an immigrant from Uzbekistan with a history of mental illness, is soon charged with killing seven men, but agents Mulder and Scully become involved in the investigation when he insists that he was possessed during the killings. His theory is given credence when another murder occurs after he was already in prison, and more gargoyle drawings are seen within his cell, which meant that he either had an accomplice or that his claims of possession had some truth to it. When Agent Smolder and Scully enter his studio, they also find a hidden room filled with gargoyle sculptures that had human bodies within them, creating tension between Mulder, who was open to any theories that would explain what was happening, and the skeptical Patterson, who had spent three years of his life working on the case. 
After another man is then attacked under similar circumstances to the other victims of Mostow and hospitalized, Patterson's partner, Nem Hauser, tells Scully that while it seemed the former mentor of Mulder disliked his methods, it was actually he who requested Mulder and Scully be assigned to the investigation, indicating that he may admire their work after all. But we later find out that though he was proud of the work his protege had been doing, something else had caused this decision. For over 1,200 years, the grotesque image has found its expression in stone, clay, wood, oil, and charcoal. Born again and again, as if resurrecting itself by its own will through tortured human expression. Could this be the same dark force at work? Its ultimate expression, the destruction of the flesh? Of the very hand that creates it? The reason the demon would force its hosts to sketch and sculpt the same image was that it wished to see its face inhabit the faces of everyone else. But because it could only possess a single person at a time, it would get those that were under its spell to sketch its face everywhere they went and to cover the faces of their victims with clay and sculptures of its own image. Obsessed with getting to the bottom of the case, Mulder dedicates a few days to studying the mythology and lore of Gargoyles to understand whether or not the possession theory of Mostow's was valid. But when Patterson arrives to see his progress, he expresses disappointment in his work. While on the surface, this may seem like a harsh admonishment of his protege, it actually had more to do with how Patterson, who dedicated so much of his life on this case, felt about it. In fact, we discover that one of the major pieces of advice he'd given Mulder in his youth was to bury yourself in the work and mind of the person you were trying to understand, which was exactly what Mulder was doing, and in this way, this is one of the first clues we get that all might not be right with his mentor. Patterson had this saying about tracking a killer, if you wanted to uh, know an artist, you had to look at his art. When Scully goes to find Mulder, who by that point had been unreachable for two days, she finds his room covered with gargoyle drawings, indicating that he was spiraling out of control. Mulder even wakes up in Mostow's studio and finds that he had made a sculpture of his own before being attacked and having his face slashed by an unknown assailant. Finally believing Mostow's stories of possession and suspecting that he himself might have been under the spell of the demonic entity, Agent Mulder goes back to see the prisoner in his cell, but the man refuses to give him any more information, stating that going against the entity was pointless as nothing that we did could affect it. Frustrated that he could not get the answers he needed, the agent even attacks Mostow, leading the criminal to suggest that the entity might have already gotten its hands onto Mulder. Things continue to look worse for the agent who again wakes up in Mostow's studio from a nightmare where he was being attacked by himself, only this time he finds himself beside the severed arm of Agent Nemhauser. And after Scully finds the blade that Mostow had used to kill his first few victims, now covered with Mulder's fingerprints, she has a meeting with Assistant Director Skinner where she voices her concern about how the case was affecting her partner. This is only compounded by a message she receives from Nemhauser, telling her to call her urgently, as when she does so, she is greeted by a confused Mulder who finds the phone in a coat beside a pool of blood in the studio, and while he does admit to handling the knife in the evidence room, he denies ever taking it. Trying to determine whether or not he'd been possessed and was responsible for the disappearance of Agent Nemhauser, Mulder finds another gargoyle in the studio, and after peeling away the clay, he finds the body of the agent in the sculpture. The agent is then confronted by Patterson, who was also unaware of how he arrived at the studio, and had his hands covered in the same clay used to make the Nemhauser sculpture. The agent then deduces that Patterson was the killer, based on his three-year obsession with Mostow, which caused him to spiral into madness, and he finally apprehends him with the assistance of Scully. The final shots in the episode showed Patterson pressed against the bars of his cell, screaming and pleading that he was innocent, and that it was the demonic entity that committed the crimes, much like the start of the episode where Mostow was professing his innocence, indicating that his obsession with understanding the criminal led to him going down the same path of the man he'd been pursuing. While Agent Mulder's final narration states that his mentor's intimate process of understanding the criminal was what drove him insane, to me, his own obsession with the gargoyle and the effect it had on him indicates that it was in actual fact a legitimate entity. I also believe that Patterson's request for Agent Scully and Mulder to investigate the case after the arrest of Mostow was a plea for help. Notice how both the agents were called in to assist with the investigation after Mostow had already been apprehended and before the copycat murders were occurring. There's also a shot of Patterson after his team escorted the criminal out of his studio, where we see the senior agent picking up the blade that Mostow had used on his victims, and we see his face depicting an uncharacteristic grin, which was the moment the gargoyle entity had possessed him. Are you listening to me? For God's sakes, isn't someone listening to me? I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I, I didn't kill them. 
While we never get a follow-up to Grotesque, I really love this episode, as the explanation behind the actions of Mostow, Patterson and Mulder remain open-ended, which is why I still believe that the demon was real and responsible for all the crimes committed by both Patterson and Mostow. Well, that's all for today, folks. A big thanks to all of you guys that have been requesting more X-Files content. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.